Okay, so new sprocket. I'm using a, a, a JT sprocket. It's good quality. Um, Yamaha ones are about two and a half times the price. Uh, why bother, really? For sprockets, just buy good aftermarket ones. And we need to double check before we fit it that the, the PCD, the mounting points here, match so that the parts guy has ordered the correct ones for us, which he has. Now, this sprocket um, is a 47 tooth. No, no, it's not. In fact, it's a 49 tooth. Wonderful. Okay. So, we've got 49 teeth on the rear sprocket, whereas previously we had 46, which means we're going to be gearing, gearing the bike down. So it's going to go slower. The larger the rear sprocket is, the slower the bike goes with more acceleration. Okay, so the front sprocket, I'm going to fit the rear sprocket in a second. The front sprocket, we now, we've returned, taken the nut off each other. That should, oh, it's not going to do, that should just slide off there. Um, they can seize on. If I get my rubber hammer, nice new one, and just put a little bit of force behind the sprocket with some fingers and give that a tap. Should. Hopefully, come off. If not, we'll have to use a puller on there. They're not normally tight on the splines. They're usually quite loose, and it's the job, uh, the nut's job, to retain it in place. Let's go turn that fuel tap off. It does smell a bit of petrol this thing. Fact. Oh, fuel leak. Okay, another job, fuel tap's leaking. Great job. Okay. Right there. Okay. There we go. Magic touch. Okay, so this is the old front sprocket, and you can probably just make out, if I compare the old, the old and the new teeth, you can now make out the difference in profile of the teeth. You see how much more material there is on the new tooth compared to the old? And if you look carefully, you'll see that this tooth here is starting to hook the material essentially has been worn away from this side of the tooth. Because don't forget that's turning in anti the anti-clockwise direction and it's pulling that chain along. So the drive side of the tooth is this one here. And that's where the wear is going to occur. And the more that wears, the more the chain can float around on that sprocket. So when you're coming off the gas, you get more lag to your engine braking, more of a clunk, we get more noise. And the chain also starts to ride up the tooth when it's under drive. And that's also bad, as it could actually jump a tooth. Um, it, I've seen these where the teeth have worn so thin, some of them are actually starting to break away. So, and this is a 16 tooth front. Hang on. Yep, so it was a 15 on the front, as you can see there, not 15. We've gone to a 16 to compensate for the additional number of teeth on the rear sprocket. So, like I was saying earlier on, we've got now we've gone from 46 to 49 teeth on the rear sprocket. That's going to make the bike go its maximum speed be less, but its acceleration be greater. However, if we go larger on the front then that will make the bike go faster and have less acceleration so the the standard policy is one tooth change on the front is the equivalent to three teeth on the back so we've gone up by 46 to 49 by three teeth on the rear and we've gone up by one tooth on the front so the gear ratio of this particular bike the final ratio is essentially about the same. Sure, we can calculate it. We could do the old sprocket, which is 46, divided by 15 will give us the ratio, um, number of turns of the front sprocket to one turn of the rear. And we can calculate the ratio of the new sprockets, which would be uh, 49 teeth 
divided by 16. And you guys can do that. I don't have time for it. Um, I did it in the shop. I know that they're about the same. And that's as near as we're going to get. And the reason why we've done this is we could not get a 46 rear sprocket. So we had to think on our feet. And this has happened many times because not all dealers keep all different size sprockets for all bikes. It just doesn't happen. Um, you've got to play around with them a bit. So we've gone slightly larger on the rear. Uh, the, the benefit of this is if the chap decides he wants to use the bike more for off-road, if he puts a 15 back on the front, and these are a lot cheaper, and these wear a lot quicker as well, 15 on the front, then he's going to have much, much reduced gearing for off-road. So there's a benefit there for the rider too. Okay, so we're going to slide the new front sprocket onto the output shaft of the gearbox. So that just goes on there like that, nice and easily. And don't forget, we've got the locking tab that goes on next. Make sure that that's all the way on the splines without your glove trap between it, there we go. And then we're gonna put a little bit of thread lock on here. But we'll do that later because I can't tighten it up yet. I can only tighten that up once we actually put uh, the rear wheel on, the chains in place and everything. So I'm just gonna put this on finger tight for now to hold the sprocket in place. I'll take it off later on, promise. And I will use some thread lock before I do a final tighten. So that's on, just holding the sprocket in place. Okay, now back to the rear sprocket. Okay, so rear sprocket going on, it can go on in any of one of four positions, makes no difference at all. That just drops onto there like that. The tabs, yeah, it's a good idea to give them a little tap flat. Just get the hammer. Makes it easier later on. There we go. Okay, so I'll pop the tabs back on. And again, because I'm a bit of a stickler, I always put thread lock on this. This is probably from the car, from the car world as well. I know there's locking tabs on there, but hey. Peace of mind, I really wouldn't want that sprocket coming loose whilst I'm riding down the road. Customers like this kind of stuff, it just shows that you actually care a little bit. And when I'm working on these bikes, or it's a car, or whatever it is, any kind of vehicle, I always make damn sure that I maintain that vehicle the same way as I've maintained my own. Especially with a bike, you've only got two wheels. I'm going to try and keep them together. Okay. One more to go. You don't need a lot of thread lock. Just a little blob on each one. You can go mad. Sometimes I go mad. Too much. Comes out too quick. Besides, it's expensive stuff. And those mechanics are very poor. We don't spend too much money, do we? So now we can tighten those up again. Try and do it evenly. You want to make sure that the sprocket seats properly on its shoulder. The sprocket is centered by these little shoulders here, not by the bolt studs itself. So it needs to go down evenly as it's pressed onto those shoulders. in a second because you can't do it with a little ratchet like that that's for sure okay sure as always there'll be a torque setting for these if you're concerned look in the Yamaha manual Yamaha dealers are really good now they'll often give you the manual or at least the parts catalogue and they'll definitely tell you what torque settings you need for things if you ask them very nicely. Flat screwdriver and a pair of vice grips. Now the flat screwdriver will, you can use initially for bending these tabs. Let me just show you what I'm on about. Okay, so on these particular tabs, 
For each nut, we've got two potential tabs to use. We only need to use one of them. And on this particular nut here, can you see, try and get it so you've got some decent light. On this tab, screwdriver, okay, so can you see on this particular nut here, we've got one flat here and one flat here. It's not in line with the tab. We don't want to use that. Here, the flat of the nut is in line with the tab, so we're going to use that tab there. Now that tab was the original tab used. It doesn't look like there's any fracture lines along here. If there were, then I definitely wouldn't use it. I'd have to use that one. That one would still be a better option. Uh, so look at this one here. So again, look, you see the original, originally bent tab aligns with the side of the nut. So we're going to be reusing that one, providing there's no fracture lines. As, a, as, a, as an alternative, as a backup, we could use that one there. And the same applies for all of them. Now, okay, so the way to do this is you put your flat screwdriver underneath. So I'm going to do this holding the camera and right, and you just lever that up, just walk it up slowly. There we go, just bend it up. Now, don't go mad because we're not going all the way. Once that's done, you can then get your vice grips in that position there. Look, that's too much. very awkward one handed. Okay, right, there we go. Okay, and then you just close your vice grips and that will pull the tab up nice and tight onto the nut. Now, when you're doing it, if you feel that that tab is a bit weak, I'm just going to test that because it felt real weak to me. So I just try and bend it open again. Okay, well, doing that first tab that you saw when you're holding the camera and struggling, because it's impossible with just one hand, um, it moved back very easily. And I'm not particularly happy with that. I think if I bend that open again, it's going to fracture off, which tells me it's not retaining that nut properly. And in which case, I'll use the, the virgin tab, so to speak. So, just giving it a tap with the back of my hand. There we go. Yeah, I'm going to use the other tab. I can see a fracture line down the back. Now all these tabs have been used the same amount, so what I'm going to do, contrary to what I said earlier on, because of the way that they feel when they've been applied, is I'm now going to use the new tab on each of the nuts. Now I know it doesn't align properly with the flat, and this is another reason why you should really use new tabs every time. But providing I get both sides of that tab wrapped around the nut tightly on each of the two flats, we should have, we should have no problems at all. So I'm just going to work my way around the wheel doing that, and then we can get the wheel put back in the bike. So you can see this time, because we're having to bend the tab, using a, a flat punch, a round punch, because I don't want to cut into the tab, that's not the idea. I'll try and preserve as much of the strength as I possibly can. Two more to go, and again we'll use that one there. That's not so bad actually. Okay, one more, and we'll get more we'll use the virgin tab. I'm going to risk using the damaged ones already. There we 
we go. Perfect. Happy with that. You can see now the tabs. Oh, they, that looks pretty good. You can see the tab is now bent. The new tab, the one that has never been used before, is bent around both, both flats, both um, adjacent flats. And that's been done on pretty much all of them. There you go, and that's what needs to be done. We've got to make sure those nuts don't come undone. Give those tabs the best chance of working. Obviously having that thread lock on there as well is a real bonus. The rear wheel can now be put back into the bike. Once that's done, then we can uh, actually put the chain on, work out the chain length, cut the chain, join the chain, Loop the chain, tension the chain, check the chain, and then we go the pint, which is quite nice. Okay, so I've just fitted the spacers back into the wheel. Uh, they were already greased, there's no need for me to do that again. I did that when I did the uh, fit the tire. Now, very important that we get the rear caliper mounted onto the caliper bracket on this particular bike. It's forms part of the swing arm. This is a bit weird because the bike's a bit of a funny angle. Okay, so that's the brake disc now going into the brake between the brake pads. That needs to be aligned properly. There we go. Wonderful. Okay. Now this is the point where it makes life a lot easier if you haven't jacked the wheel too high off, off the ground because it makes it a lot easier getting the, the wheel spindling. Okay. Now there's no chain to worry about, so that's easy enough. No need to hammer it. The back of your palm should be sufficient. Now you've just got to double check that you've got a pad either side of the disc, which we have. Just the brake pedal a bit. Yep, there we go. And that the caliper is securely mounted on the, the caliper um, bracket, whatever it has. There's lots of different designs. Uh, on this particular one, it's just a, a shoulder on the swing arm. And uh, if it was in the wrong place and when you applied the rear brake, the caliper would try to move around with the disc and it would cause all sorts of problems. So, uh, the wheel's still loose. It is still airborne. I'm just going to pop the outer nut on loosely. Once my fingers have dried out, it's horrible. Horrible both these things. But hey, you know, you've got to wear them. That's what it's all about. Some pretty nasty stuff in oil these days. A job like this, without trying to do it to camera and just getting on with it, would take 20 minutes, half an hour. This is actually one of the easier bikes to do. Very simple, easy access to everything. Um, if I fit the chain and sprocket kit while I was doing the tyre, then as regards the labour element, it will be another 15 minutes additional workshop time to do the chain sprockets at the same time. Doesn't take long. Um, but you can always come across problems, you know, things can slow you down. Things don't always go to plan. And you shouldn't just give your customer a fixed time. I don't think so. Things can go wrong. Take you a lot longer, bolts and shear and things. And uh, in my opinion, the workshop, the workshop shouldn't uh, have to stand that cost. It's your customer's bike. It may be the customer's bike may have been neglected for a long, long time. In which case, you know, we shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't be the ones having to pay for that additional labour content to uh, to sort the problems out. So what I'm doing now is I'm moving the wheel, just backing off all the chain adjustment adjusters, the alignment adjusters on the swing arm right to the end 
both sides. These, this one has two separate nuts, which are locked together once you crack them off. They should move quite freely. Sometimes you might want to run a, I will run that one, run a wire brush over the threads. On this side there's still a lot of dirt in the threads, we don't want that to work its way into the, into the nuts. All that's going to do is cause the threads in the side of the nut to wear down. And premature failure again, you don't want. Okay, one. Okay, so now I can slide the, uh, the, the wheel forwards all the way in the swing arm. And I'm just going to put a little bit of pressure on that nut. Just to hold it. Just to hold the wheel forwards. Right, the wheel's all the way forwards. And now we can pop the chain on there. So, the chain that I've chosen for this bike is a DID 520. It's an O-ring chain, this one. O-rings, there's no point these days in buying, well, maybe for motocross bikes and stuff, but anything road going, you want an O-ring chain on there minimum. If it's a performance bike, then go for some kind of X-ring chain, because you'll lose, Ooh. new split link, look at that. Um, if you go for an X-ring chain, then you're gonna lose uh, less of your engine output. The, the chain itself is, it's, uh, it's all to do with how much energy it takes to bend and rotate those links. And O-rings are very good at keeping the dirt out, which is the whole idea of those seals. They are quite hard to turn. Every time that has to go around a sprocket, it's using some energy that the engine's produced to do that. It's not very efficient. So if you go for an X-ring chain, then you're going to get more performance. Now on a trail bike like this, performance, it's not built for performance. It's built for fun and off-road ability and comfort and that kind of thing. So an O-ring chain is ideal for it. A little bit cheaper. Uh, it'll last just as long, I'm sure. Uh, if you go any kind of performance bike, R1s, R6s, whatever, then go for a, an, uh, an X-ring chain because that's going to use a lot less or absorb a lot less of your engine output, which means you can go a bit faster, which is... What a sports bike's all about, isn't it? Okay, so this chain is 112 links, which is, and they're, they're always in uh, multiples of two, even numbers. Uh, we have gone for larger sprockets, don't forget. So, as a result, we're probably not going to have to shorten this chain. Up. chain about one o'clock on the rear sprocket, the, the, the join. And then, oh there you go, look, so we can lose a link. Cool. All right, so we have to remove, I'll do a close-up for you, we have to remove um, this section here, so we're going to grind off that pin and that pin, get rid of that outer plate, and then we can use the split link to bring it all together. Yeah, there's still plenty of slack on there, so that's fine. Okay, so we know we've got to remove a link, so we can drop that out of there, pull the chain out, pop it in the vise, and then I'll show you how to do that. Right, new chains are uh, covered in a, a very thick, gloopy, sticky um, grease, essentially a chain lubricant uh, for storage, and if you get it on your hands, it's just a nightmare. So it's a really good idea when you're doing chains and sprocket kits, always wear your gloves. And um, because we're going to be grinding and there's dirt flying around and stuff, best to wear eye protection as well. It's very useful and sensible. Um, if you're like me, then you'll have learnt after 30 years of fixing stuff that getting stuff in your eyes, it's not much fun. Okay, so we've got the, the chain here out of the bike. And I need to, this is, each one of these is a link. So we've got, oh, hold on camera. We've got a link here a link here, here, and so on. 
and we've got to remove these in pairs so I have to grind out that link there and that link there to separate the chain and then we're going to end up with the end of this chain looking a bit like that and that will allow us to use our joiner okay so this is uh, I'm going to use an angle grinder for this uh, with actually a slit disc on it because it's very accurate for grinding I don't want to damage any other components damaging this plate's fine obviously I want to grind the head of that pin off and that one there as well but using a big grinding wheel you can bounce around a bit and I might damage the, one of the other adjacent links which is a bad idea one angle grinder I'll try and keep it away from the camera if I can Okay, so I've now ground off the two rivet heads, the ends of those two pins, and we should now be able to flip the chain around the vise. There we go. Always a good idea to use vise jaws. We don't want to damage the chain. Pop it back into the vise, and then we can get a bit of leverage on there to split it. Okay. So now we should, in theory, he says confidently, be able to put a screwdriver between there Remember it's quite hot still, and just leave, give it a lever. There you are, she's coming out. Perfect. Okay, so that is, there you go, the outer plate, the outer drive plate, and then we've got the inner plate with the two pins and we've just gained ourselves a few spare little tiny o-rings now just while we're on the difference between an o-ring chain and a standard chain is obviously these little o-rings and the idea is that these little o-rings form a seal between the outside world and the lubrication that are on these pins here we don't want water road grit and stuff getting in and contaminating these pins and that's what happens on a standard chain the seals also help to prevent this oil that's already in there during manufacture from uh, leaching out uh, and the pin and the the pins becoming uh, or having no lubrication that's what we saw on the old chain it had all disappeared and the pins had started to wear and and the, the wear was very evident um, so these o-rings are a great way of separating the outside world uh, to these pins and keeping the grease in there. The downside is because they're rubber on steel they create friction. If we had just just the steel, so we flip one of those rubbers out and we have just steel on steel which is the same as a standard chain, if I can get back on I can't, but anyway it, it flows much much easier, a lot less friction there with the rubber in there as well much harder to turn. Um, but the new generation, the X-ring chains, have a lot less friction, but they still create a good seal. So anyway, that's what you need to do to remove links. Now, every now and again, you do have a chain where you only want to remove one link. Um, it's not that old, common these days. On the older bikes, it was more obvious, a bit more common. Um, if that's the case, you're going to have to go and buy what's called a half link. And most motorcycle shops, good motorcycle shops, will, ha will keep half links in stock for you. Okay, so we'll go back over to the bike, we'll drop this chain back on, and I'll show you how to fit the new clip, the new spring clip to hold that chain in place. Okay, so you can see I've dropped the chain back onto the bike, and now we've got the two halves, two ends of the chain lined up about one o'clock on the rear sprocket. You also got a good shot of those tabs being bent down now as well. And we're going to fit the, uh, the new split link. I'll show you how to do that. Quite quite an easy job, but there's 
one right way of doing it and many, many wrong ways. Okay. When you're undoing the packaging, it's always a good idea not to lose any of the little O-rings. If you do, it's not the end of the world. If you've cut the chain down, you will have a couple of spares from the other links. So in the pack, you get a, an inner drive plate with the pins. You get an outer drive plate, and it should be the numbers, the, the stamp numbers to the outside. Uh, we've got four little O-rings, and I'll show you how those go in. And then you've got the new spring clip, and you must use a new one of those every time you fit or separate the chain. Normally you wouldn't have to separate the chain other than replacing it, so it's not normally a problem. Now, the first job, I've got to keep moving the camera around, is to add a couple of O-rings to the inner drive plate. So I'll do that, just drop them down the little pins without dropping them on the floor. It's not easy with gloves on, but you would be grateful later on. Sometimes I get upset and take them off. Okay, so you've got now two O-rings on the pins. Next job is inside the sachet. Get a little sachet of grease. Should be using that. Put a little bit of that grease actually um, on each of those two pins. That's the only lubrication this chain is going to get. So it's down to you to make sure it's happy. Um, sure, you, you're going to lubricate the chain with chain oil, and it will it will work its way in to some extent. But um, what you what you put in there now is definitely what it's going to be living off for the first period of its life. This is where it gets real messy, so you need a rag with you, okay? And there's lots of excess. They give you way more than you actually need. Assuming that you're going to blather it all over yourself and your arms and your tools and half your customer's motorcycle and that kind of thing. So, there you go, it's all blathered in lubricant now. And all you do is you slide that in from the back. Real easy, in she goes, sorted. And you'll see it keeps springing back, that's the O-rings just going up onto our little shoulder. So we're going to have to hold that in position as we put the, uh, the outer drive plate on. Now, don't forget the next O-rings need to go on, and they go onto the onto there. Look like that. It's one, and the one onto that. It's incredibly fiddly, and sometimes you get a bit upset. And now you want some more of this um, greasy lubricant stuff on the outer drive plate, so it's going to lubricate those O-rings. We don't want them tearing up, and then. We've then got to squash that whole thing together. To get this whole thing to compress, you just need to use some decent size of grips and you should be able to get enough force on there. There we go, look, to crush the whole thing together. If you've got the tool, which I do, but I'm not going to use it uh, today. If you've got the tool uh, for doing rivet links, then you can actually use that tool to perform this operation as well. But in all honesty, this. This is, this is good enough. Just going to make sure that's squashed all the way. And then, if I just clean off some more of that grease, you should be able to see the grooves. There we go. Don't really want any grease in this area anyway, so it's not a bad thing to take it out of the way. There we go. Okay, so you can see now that the, the outer drive plate and the inner drive plate have been squashed together sufficiently to now expose the groove where the clip goes. It's like a double circlip that goes on there. Spring clip. Must go on in that orientation. We always fit the clip on the top of the chain. It makes it a lot easier to work on. That goes on there. Oops, like that. Very hard with gloves on. Good old PPE, right. So now, I'm going to put the screwdriver down here and use the screwdriver to lever it rearwards and it should just clip over those pins. But at the same time, there we go. Cool, we're on. So 
at the same time you must push the clip towards the, the outer drive plate um, otherwise you might risk it not following the groove and if it doesn't follow the groove it's going to over expand and get damaged so there you go that's how you fit a split link to a final drive chain uh, correctly um, and obviously it shows you the orientation that that clip must go in with the closed end forwards that's really really important I can't stress that too much um, I've seen so many chains where it's been wrongly installed okay so I've centered the bike back on the hoist onto the bike to be completely vertical it had to be off the um, off the jack wants to be under its own weight and um, now I'm going to use the adjusters to adjust the chain and to align the rear wheel so that the rear wheel's in alignment with the frame if you have the wrong adjustment one side to the other then of course the bike's going to crab as you go around the corners it's going to go around left hand corners real easy for example and then really hard around the other corners now there is a slight amount of tension on the um, rear wheel spindle that's fine and you put a little bit on there to stop it moving around that's way too slack. We're looking for about half to three quarters of an inch travel either way from the center. Now, if you get it right first time, it makes life a lot easier. But of course, if you need to push the wheel forwards again, then uh, you're gonna have to slacken off the wheel spindle. Now, Yamaha have been real nice to us. There are some markings actually on the, the swing arm, some little lines, and that allows us, as long as we get the same both sides, we know that the wheel is in alignment, provided nobody has changed the size of these washers. If you find that one washer is a different size to the other, then of course the alignment is going to be out if you use the lines. So make sure that the washers are the correct ones for the bike. Okay, so we are bang on the first line that side, and we're just over on this side, so we can afford to do a little bit more. Okay, we're getting close. As, um, as the suspension's compressed, on most bikes, not all, most bikes, this chain will become tighter. So we've got to be conscious of that. Um, if you've got someone here that can sit on the bike for you, you can pull the bike down, they can sit on the bike, and you can see now there's actually less travel. Loads of travel, less travel. And the last thing you'd want is for that chain to become tight before the suspension is fully traveled. If that was the case, then when you're riding off road or whatever and the suspension is getting compressed, then the chain tension would inhibit the suspension travel. And worse than that is it's gonna put uh, undue loading on the gearbox output bearing on that shaft. Um, I was in, uh, was it Belgium somewhere with my brother, Phil. He was, he was running a KTM 640 Supermotard same bike that I had, and the dealership had just fitted a new chain. Now those bikes essentially are trail bikes uh, that we use on the road, they've got road tyres, and they had done exactly that, they'd over tensioned the chain, and within a couple of thousand k's of the ride, it was a long ride, the output uh, seal on the gearbox sprocket, the output sprocket, uh, had started to leak, and that's because the output bearing was starting to collapse on the bike. And that, that was a pretty new bike. It was its first chain and sprocket kit from new. It had done 12,000 kilometers maybe, maximum. So uh, we had to pull it all apart, check it, put a new seal in there. Uh, we could do nothing about the bearing. That was the dealership's warranty issue. We put a new seal in, we could do that the side of the road. Uh, and we slackened off the chain. Uh, and we actually had no further problems. It, it, we finished the trail, um, got back a week later, took it down to the dealership, and they had to do a full engine rebuild on that bike to change that bearing, all because they over tensioned this chain. So really important that you make sure you've got sufficient chain tension. And on trail bikes, it looks like you've got heaps of slack when there's no rider on the bike, but it's always a good idea to get a couple of people to sit on the bike so that the suspension becomes fully compressed, just to make sure that that chain doesn't bind up, it doesn't get over tight. But if it does, you're gonna to start to cause damage to the bike. Um, also, with a new chain, it will bed in. So within a couple of hundred k's, it's going to need to be retensioned. Now, there may not be any change, but um, there probably will be. 
and if it's left until its next service, that chain will be unduly slack. If it gets too slack, it could jump a sprocket, it could come off, cause an accident. So it's really important that you tell your customer, or if it's your bike, that you actually recheck the chain, chain tension a couple of hundred k's down the line. Okay, well, I'm happy with that, that's pretty good. Um, we're just over that one, and just over the one on this side. So I'm now going to tension up that rear wheel spindle, get it nice and tight. It's not going to move anywhere. Uh, on this particular bike, it has a split pin. I'll put the split pin back through later on. A new one, obviously. Now again, the manufacturer will stipulate a torque setting for this rear wheel spindle. Nearly there. Cool, okay, happy with that. Now we're not finished. Next job is now to run these adjusters back down the lock nuts down to the adjustment nuts. The spindle's not moving anywhere, that's now tight. We hold the adjuster nuts and then take the lock nuts down to it. Doesn't need to be super tight, it does need to be done. There we go. Cool. Okay, so chain tension is set. We now need to prevent the rear wheel from turning again. So I'll get that set up with the strap and some thread lock on there. We can tighten that up and then bend those tabs over. Okay, so just a dab of thread lock on those threads. Doesn't need a lot, too much as always. There we go. Now again, make sure that that locking plate stays upon the splines and it's the recess towards the gearbox, towards the sprocket. That allows for those additional protruding splines. We actually need that sprocket to be tight up against the spacer on the gearbox. We're now going to tension up that nut. There's no way that the wheel should be able to turn. The, uh, the brake is on nice and tight and the wheel is clamped down to the the bike hoist as well, so I'll just give it a good tension up. There we go. Okay, next job is just to bend over those tabs, and we can just get behind one of the tabs. I'll use the Virgin tab, the one that hasn't been used before. There we go. punch. Now remember we can now turn this around if we need to. I think I can just about get in as it is. There we go. Cool. Done. And remember when we came to this bike to pull it apart that tab had not even been bent down. So on assembly, we've got thread lock in there and we've got a bent tab onto one of the flats of that sprocket. So we are twice as good as it used to be. Okay. Just time to put the chain guard back on now. That lined up. Again, it's only a plastic cover, it doesn't want to be over tight. And if you want to put thread lock on the bolts, you can. These are a little bit stiff on the threads anyway, so there's no chance they're going to come under my length. Some chain guard covers a steel, aluminium, whatever. This is just a plastic one, so it doesn't need a great torque on those bolts. And lastly, the gear lever, now remember we said on the end of the shaft, there's a little tiny pin mark, little center dot, and that's got to be in line with that groove there. That means that the levers are going to be at the right height for the rider. Some riders, take those off. Some riders do prefer to um, have them in a different position. 
pretty good to me. Little tap. And now for the bolt. Yeah. I like easy stuff. Today's been easy. Also, I went to primary. Really. It's good. So once this is done up, all that's left to do now is to fit the chain guard and to put a split pin through that uh, rear wheel spindle. And then jack it up again, loop the chain, get it off the hoist, go for a test ride. That's why I always enjoy doing test rides. Oh, it could be a test ride for the pub. Hey, that'll work. Okay, gear lever's back on in the correct position. Okay, chain guard, very easy to fit. There we go, I'll put that one on first, that's easiest. Single hex. Good old tang. Here you go. Oh yes. Right. Done. With your little split pin, try and find one the same size. Biggest you possibly can fit really. And that wants to go in through there. I always do them this way up because they're easy to do because you can see what you're doing. And then if you get what get the longest end, just bend it down. Bend it over the end, <laughs> nearly, onto there, and then that one just down, that recess down there, okay. And there you go, one split pin fitted. Um, I'll reset the jack and uh, lube up the chain, job done. Okay, so when you're loading up the chain, it's important you don't put too much on. This is a brand new chain, it's already got uh, some lubrication out of the packet on there. You've got to try and avoid getting the chain lube on the tyre. That's a bad thing. It tends to make people fall off and then they get a bit upset if they survive. Um, you're aiming really at the centre rollers and between the um, drive plate and the actual sort of dog burn link in the middle. And I always do it with the chain in the normal direction. Are you going towards the gearbox because then any any overspill tends to end up down this end and not dripping off the back of the rear sprocket. It's a bit tight on that rear brake, to be honest. Sense the rear brake overhaul coming on shortly. So there you have it. We fitted um, today, amongst many other jobs that I've been doing. I did a car breakdown this morning. Um, a chain and sprocket kit, final drive chain and sprocket kit to a 1998 Yamaha 660 Tenere. Um, we found a few faults that were on the bike as we did the work. Um, the front sprocket retaining nuts, the tabs hadn't been bent down. Uh, what else did we find? Oh, maybe that was it. I don't know. But she's good now. Um, that's the last job on this bike this time round. It's had a rear tyre fitted. I've rebuilt the front forks with new uh, fork seals because one of them was leaking. Um, I have noticed a couple of issues that need looking at. One is that the rear caliper appears to be binding a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll look at that and see what's going on. That could be another video. Who knows? My name is Andy Young. I'm one of the uh, lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland. We teach automotive. Um, part of our course is motorcycles, um, although we don't teach too much on the motorcycle side of it. Um, I am a warrant of fitness guy for motorcycles as well as cars here in New Zealand, uh, and I do get to work on a lot of bikes at home. Um, 
I feel it's helpful to you to, uh, to produce these videos. So it's not just for my students, although my students, most of them tend to go into the car industry. One or two of them are keen on motorcycles and it's good to show them how to do this, uh, these jobs properly. Uh, and at Unitech, we don't really have many bikes to work on, if any, to be perfectly honest. Um, so it's these kind of videos that are invaluable to those students that are going to move on uh, into motorcycle workshops uh, later on to give them an idea of what needs to be done and how to do things the correct way. So I hope you found this video helpful. Um, I've certainly enjoyed doing it. I always do. Cheers. Over and out.